Terra incognita spectator. Terra incognita spectator. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured author's website and publications. This month's author is Kim Westwood. Kim is known for her strong original style and a number of her stories have featured in year's bests, while our excellent science fiction novel, The Daughters of Moab, was reviewed in TISF No. 1 way back in November 2008. The story she's reading, Nightship, shares much with her first novel, strong characters, a seamlessly created future world, and poetic use of language to draw us into the story of a cabin boy who wishes for more than her world is prepared to offer. Here the linen smells of mice and the men of old boots. I lie beneath a slaughter of ferals, cushioned in my guilty comforts, and waiting for this black caulked hulk to sink. But it glides like death along the briny channels of a shrouded city half submerged, a grey zone, neither sea nor shore. Past my porthole, other night ships slice the mist, thickening on dank canals. Blunt-nosed, barnacled, they nudge from lock to lock, deals done and deliveries made under cover of a perpetual fog. Now that I am owned, ship's boy to a baron, I have been sewn up to make certain. And if it wasn't me they'd chosen for those rough, practised hands, it would have been another. Ship surgeon Crake, who did the work on me, doubles as a dentist for the crew, and God's help the bleeders, a midwife. Midshipman Nog went to him for bunions on his toes. The lancing knife took the ends off each in one quick disconnection, Crake shouting as he cut, You'll fit a smaller shoe and use less leather. A bloody stump Nog has now and cries at night in his bunk across the bulkhead from me. I know, since he is not captive, he could jump ship at any time. But for what? For where? Gallimard would say for Kosciuszko, a distant mountain west that climbs above our creeping winter into sunlight. But none of us, the bonded, sold, have ever seen it or will ever go, and the crew, all five of them barons, including Nog, won't speak of it. Three years ago, at thirteen, I was bonded to my captain, a metal merchant and fur trader. Some say it's a sorry pact compared to smelter work, but she is better than most, and amid the business of it I feel a fierce attachment. The barons, although powerful among the iron families, are not the cruelest, and tucked between her threats are rough endearments and promises of protection, safe passage. So when she brings out the knife to tease, threatening to cut my stitches then have them re-sewn tighter, I listen with a hellish joy, and behind my pleas and protestations there is desire for her hand to snick. Above deck the ship's bell sounds, eyes port, and it's force of habit that makes me press my face to the rimy glass as we pass below a row of bodies, heads in sacks, suspended from canal-side cranes. Pacifists mainly, and any others, the infidelitous and effete that threaten the family system. From my pelted bower I hear shouts starboard and tinkly bells, the graunching of a girl barge alongside. The captain and her first lieutenant are off to spend what leisure time they have. Later, when the barge returns, she will fall sated into bed, smelling of glitter and oil and a barge girl's milky seed. But it's of no matter to me. I am her true companion, kept for an entirely different pleasure. I close my eyes to the caress of air, 
a quick filigree touch, then the sharp edge of a fingernail down my cheek, not my captain, but the ghost of ship's boy Aggie at my bedside. You like it too much, she says, a glimmer. I make as if to grab her, but she jinks away, an old game. She was always faster, lighter than me, a mere slip of a boy whose misfortune it was to be too lithe, too handsome at thirteen, and in the short years she had beyond that age, when fate and family collude to choose our adult occupations. Until then we are considered children and ungendered. At that deciding time we are given titles, man, woman, girl or boy, according to our station. All those in the iron families, irrespective of their physiology, are named as men, while those of us born out of family who pass through puberty and never bleed are sewn up and called boys. We become deck and kitchen hands on the ships, and sometimes, with mixed fortune, captain's companions. Others go to work in the shipyard smelters, or eke a living scavenging for scrap uranium in the waste pits. The last brings better pay, but a shorter life. Those at Menarch, bleeders, and there are far fewer of them than us, are the only ones announced as women. Exchanged by their own families for a generous stipend, they are sent to the birthing farms for procreative duty, the iron families being mostly barren. And only when they are fully spent do they rejoin the populations in the grey zone, living out their broken spinsterhood, cared for by those of their siblings not sold at auction. But the girl barges are another thing. Decked with swathes of coloured cloth and strings of bells, they are a floating misery, a tinsel jail for those youths born out of family and whose seed has been deemed unworthy of another generation. Most of these ill-affected are drowned before they reach thirteen, but the rest the iron families visit for distraction. Aggie used to say she could hear the crying long before a barge appeared. And now, I ask? She looks as if she might not answer. I hear it all the time. When the barge has pushed into the mist and the decks above are silent, I seek out Nog and we sit midship, wedged under the dinghy tarps out of a sleeting headwind. His foot is bound with filthy strips of rag and festering. I want him to see Gally Ma, who's dressed my wounds many times and has kinder hands and better medicines than Crake. But as far as Nog is down the family's pecking order, he is still one of them and spits pacifist. I don't argue. She's told me the story. I peer up at the soot flurries from a floating immolation beer and change the subject. Nog, can you tell where one city ends and the next begins? He replies, they're all one now, the towns and cities laced together, but the old names have been given to the locks. How far do the canals extend? As far as there is land north and south, I've heard, but I've only sailed the central stretch, old New South Wales, between the steel ports. Those families that ply the most northerly and southerly reaches, the Surders, Presidents and Muftis, I've never seen. I wonder what he knows of Kosciuszko. And West? I ask. Nothing. An indefinite mist. He shifts position, lifting his bandaged foot with both hands as a foul smell wafts and taps the dinghy at his back. My escape, he says, if ever I should want it. His roomy eyes look past the cargo crane and forecastle winches to the gatling gun niched at the bow, then fix on me. This whole ship is radioactive. We are radioactive. What's that mean, I ask, although the answer makes no difference. He considers. Soon we'll be deader than dodos. I don't ask him about dodos. Those of us born into the grey zone know we are living a madness, that our world is dying and the families are getting from it what they can. From somewhere aft there comes an angry shout, the landing thwack of leather, a shrill scream. 
ship's boy moth, forever picked on by the crew, being punished for some petty misdemeanour. I think of Aggie. Don't you ever wish, she used to say, arms crossed about a body lean like a sapling as she stared into the mist. I would follow her gaze to where ship's lights floated in fuzzy strings and shore beacons blinked. No, I'd reply, and it was true. I had no spirit for adventure, no fire for any challenge other than my owner, whose dangerous changeability, the beckonings and dismissals, kept me hooked. But in truth there was no one more precious to me than Aggie, and I was often afraid for her. Wishing, I warned, will only bring you trouble. And trouble came in the form of a shogun who took a liking to her features and tried to spirit her off the ship. In the fight that ensued, the shogun was killed, and so was Aggie, caught between blades. The feud between the two families has lasted a full year, and each night since poor Aggie was tipped dead into the canal, I have dreamt a ship of ghosts, with her leaning from the prow, hair flying, and I, its frail, deluded helmsman, led by Min Min lights across the marshlands to the snowy sides of Kosciuszko. Nog eases painfully out into the sleet and stumps off to prepare for docking. Left alone, I bring the razor blade from my boot across my forearm and feel the satisfaction as it beads a bright living red. Many things the captain will command and I will bear the marks of, but this I do entirely for myself. The scars and being captain's companion sets me apart. Aggie never cared and the privilege of the latter made me fast friends with Nog. But from the ship's boys there has always been a reticence, as if those two things laid between us have made an uncrossable divide. My captain has me on the long chain so I can reach all parts of the cabin as I wish. Her back to me she is taking inventory with her second in command. A new deal struck with the Rajas, a ship's boy maimed in a recent act of carelessness. I wonder that she can't see their third, seraphim bright, and leaning both elbows on the table. Aggie winks. The lieutenant tells the hard news to his commander last. The Viscounts have begun a new campaign of mutilation against the Muktas, he says, and her shoulders lift for a breath, then drop. I thought that ended long ago she responds low tone, and both are silent a moment, remembering. Before the Eastern Industry Alliance was forged, the families, dukes and barons, earls and emirs, viscounts, rajahs and muktas, just some, were forever at war among themselves and developed a taste for it. When they began to mutilate each other's children in an effort to champion their own line, most were left barren. My thoughts are on the captain. She had never let me see her unclothed, and instinctively I had always known why. Her second takes his leave, and she stares a while, unseeing at the door, then leans down to the shackle on the chair leg and begins to haul me in. Late afternoon we moor at Southhead for a stoning. A bleeder has betrayed her family and aborted their child. I doubt she meant to but that's immaterial. The captain and I climb the path to a high, solitary place clotted with mist and strewn with rocks. The emirs are gathered in a wide circle, their accused crouched before them in her burial shroud. We take our places at the back of the crowd, being invited guests and this not our family's trouble. As a signal comes from one, a scythe of arms is raised and the first volley flies. The woman screams once, twice, then on and on, a lacerating wail above the sick thudding of stones. I wipe my sleeve across my eyes as if some dirt is lodged there. I can't be seen to sympathise. I sneak a look at my baron beside me, nothing to betray her thoughts, except perhaps the up-down-up of her Adam's apple and the white press of her lips. The woman topples to one side, 
silent now, a foot released from the bloody huddle in the pooling stain from cloth to dirt. For her at last it's over, but in my belly something forlorn and wild is rising, a serrated ache that tears from my stitching to my heart. I want to turn my head and puke, but for my captain I must contain myself or be punished for shaming her family. The broken body is picked off the ground and carried to a pit at the side of the field. There she is dropped, so small, no more than rags, and a little dirt kicked in. The captain goes to thank the emirs for being included on their guest list and to say she will be sure to return the favour when the barons next have a hanging. Then we leave along the well-trod track back to our ship moored with others in the lock below. Ma says the barons dress like last century South Sea pirates. The other families have quite different styles. We, their bonded, are generally attired in the cast-offs and can tell on sight to which family each belongs. And so it is with their punishments, which have become signature. Stoning is popular with the emirs and muktas, while the barons favour hanging or decapitation, which at least is quick. The rajas go for immolation, and the viscounts and dukes prefer public floggings where the agony is drawn out for hours. I often wonder how they find so many to punish. Are the canal cities still so chock full of dissenters? Or is it that the iron families have found, like me, a cathartic pleasure in the ministry of pain? Mornings I am sent to help Gally Ma. Of Torres Strait stock, home swept away long ago, she is large-boned and reassuring, queen of her kitchen. This morning she is both hands in the soy dough, squeezing it with soothing repetition. The progeny of pacifists, like her, used to have their left hand, the hand of darkness, sliced off. But Ma has two. It was by Aditi's grace, she says, that I was found to have a certain talent in the kitchen and so kept both my hands. Her forebears were among those who tried to keep the Iron families from their trajectory to power. I ask again how she escaped the Kyoto uprising when all the rest were killed. She taps her nose, mysterious about her past. But once I overheard that she and the captain had agreements that went further back than my short life. And although she gladly takes the role of stand-in for our own mothers... She seems perpetually ungendered, neither man nor woman, but something unnamed in between. As boys filter in from around the ship, she motions us closer. Those most recently bonded and still with keepsakes, thumb failing palm screens that flicker with the likeness of their parents' faces. I'd had one too once, but it was tossed by Crake into the canal soon after I arrived on board. When we are settled, nine of us, around her workbench and fixed on her expectantly, she waves her arm towards the black socket of a porthole and begins. Today, let's think of this as Venice and us as gondoliers. She describes that city of art built above canals, its floating white beauty trellised in light and eventually swallowed by the sea and I peer out trying to imagine it as a barge girl floats past, his pale face illumined by the starboard navigation lights. I gasp, and the other boys rush to look. Veils drift, gossamer about him. Sequins dot his skin like tiny stars. I am reminded of the jellyfish that slop against the hull and levee walls at turn of tide. Ma's conversation takes a different tack. It was the weathermen, she says, who envisaged this, our fog-bound world. Back when the skies still turned their daily blue and the sun kept us warm. So, of course, no one listened. The skies began to darken bit by bit. But did any of us take special note the last day the red disk of the sun burnt unobscured above? 
Did we sear that hot image on our retinas so that afterward our memories could fill the lacuna in the sky? She pauses a moment, a reservoir of sadness, then looks carefully around as if to record the geometry and colour of each of us. The inspection ends at moth, fresh welts congealing above the collar of her shirt. Ma slaps the dough aside to start on another piece. The day the landscape of our lives was set for change, there should have been a warning sound, a siren, or a thunderclap. Instead, the machinery of old divisions ratcheted soundlessly together as the iron families were united under one dominion. They have always paid heed to an angry and intolerant god, and so Kyoto was quelled by slaughter. But by far the worst of it was saved for the pacifists, who were an anathema to the family's way of doing business. We boys sit hushed above the resting hum of the ship's reactor and the faint clicking of the iron exchanges inching us along. With the images of beauty, Venice, the sun reflecting off shiny cities edged with blue, chased away and we bereft, our minds turn to what else we'd lost. Gallimard takes pity on us and brings out her picture books. She lays them on her workbench and slowly turns the pages as we pour goggle-eyed over faded illustration plates. Once, she says, you could dig in the soil and find a myriad creatures or look to the sky and see the shapes of birds. But we lost them all, except the ferals, their frail perfection barely a memory now. We are left with fog and the structures of our own making, the canals and enough industry to build a hundred ships. But for what? What kind of future here? Or perhaps the families think to conquer other countries cleaner and more sane than ours. Her tone carries a warning, but our thoughts are stuck on something else, another beauty. Show us the thing we implore. And then she brings out her most precious of all, a blue-green globe, and sets it spinning slowly on its stand. Never forget, she tells us, one eye on the door, that the world is bigger than this fog-bound stretch we sail, and although the iron families hold sway here, they may not elsewhere. This is more than she has ever said, and we hold our breaths at the blasphemy of it as she stops the globe, her finger pressed to a fat familiar shape set amid the blue, terror obscura. Then she traces a flowery line to a peaked contour near its eastern edge and whispers, Kosciuszko. The ship stinks, a slew of ferals being skinned on the aft deck. Their innards will go to Gallimard. The rest is destined for the tannery at our next stop. I am primly at the rail in my ship's boy's best, waiting for the captain. She is off to a thirteen sail, and I am to go with her. Watch your back, says Nog, sluicing the bloody deck with canal water. I look at his tattooed arms, working the thick bristled broom, his bad leg dragging. We both know if he goes to Crake, he'll lose the leg, but likely it's the only thing between him and creeping gangrene. I wonder if he'll still be here when I return. A dinghy is lowered, and then I row the captain and her lieutenant up a narrow course off the main canal between tall buildings sitting empty, their feet in water, to market place, a cloistered square filled with floating wooden piers. Those who've recently turned of age have been brought here for auction. The city's inhabitants shadow the arcades, hunched on all manner of boats to watch their offspring being handed into service. The money from each sale is generous. The proceeds from a bleeder will feed them for a year. But whenever one is taken by a family with a reputation for unusual cruelty, a collective sigh goes up and gusts a hollow wind around the colonnades. I ease the dinghy toward the main viewing platform, the family's designated bidders assembled in front. 
The thirteen-year-olds are gathered on a central raft and being called one by one to the auctioneer's stand. Some of them have already been marked by fate for certain occupations. Pity help the gazelle-boned youths, eyes down so as not to catch the gaze of the barge owners, as if that might save them. The wide-hipped bleeders, so soft, so round, attract the greatest interest and fiercest bidding, their manifest fertility sought after to carry a family name. Three years ago, when Aggie and I were brought here and bonded to my captain's vessel while those at Menark were winnowed out and sent to do their duty, I too thanked Aditi that I never bled, because although bleeders are cosseted and want for nothing, they lead a far more captive life than ours. With the dinghy nosed against the viewing platform, the captain takes her place among the bidders. I remain with the officer in the boat, trying not to look too hard into the cloisters. Then one is led onto the auction stand that stops the breath in me. Arrestingly curvaceous, clearly a bleeder, my younger sibling Ina's time has come. I wonder if this is why we are here today. I try to will it so, afraid of the other bidders, and slowly they drop away until there are only two, my captain and a shogun. The square falls silent, aware of the feud between the families. As the bid climbs, I grip the oars and call silently, and Ina's gaze seems to rest a while in mine. Finally, there is a lull in the bidding, my baron's the last, and I think she's won. But just before Hammerfall, the shogun makes another bid so high that even the families gasp. My captain, all done, gestures no more bids. But even at distance I feel her taut and thunderous and know it isn't over. The shogun, triumphant, steps along the pier and up to the auction stand to claim his prize. He draws his sword as if to offer us his competition, a warrior's salute, then turns and swings, slicing Ina through. The crowd sucks in its shock, then expels it with a roar. I scream my sibling's name as the captain leaps into the dinghy, shouting, Row! They are coming at us from all sides, an angry wave, their tethered lives, tight leashes snapped, and the shoguns are all blades out to fight. The other families, caught unprepared, scramble to escape. When we are away from the square in quieter waters and making for the ship, my captain speaks to her second. They'll rise against us for what we do. This thin control can't last. The families must change their ways. The lieutenant, a baron of only slightly lesser standing, answers just as grim. If the families change their ways, they will be slaughtered. They stay silent for the rest of the trip, and I am left to row until my arms are numb and my sorrow has been ploughed into the fetid, oil-slicked water. The barons are celebrating. They have sailed a flotilla of powered rafts across the marshlands and conquered Kosciuszko. The news of their success, the expedition undisclosed till now, has diverted attention from the crackdowns in the grey zone and been relayed to the other families, all of whom had secretly vied to get there first. And other news has reached our ship. Halfway up they found a hidden enclave of pacifists and torched it. The twelve they didn't burn they brought back to punish. My captain paces with heavy boots, six to my bed, turn, six to the door, one for every pitiable prisoner. I stay quiet beneath the coverlet in case her agitation turns to anger and she lashes out. If I had been chosen for that trip, she mutters, and I'm left to wonder what might have turned out differently if she had. I am reminded that even she bends her will to a higher authority, the family's inner circle, its most influential barons. When I get the chance, I seek out Nog, always a source of information. What will happen to them, I ask? You'll know soon enough, 
he says, gruff and unforthcoming. Now move your molly-coddled ass and help. The ship's bilges are being emptied at a canal-side treatment plant. Hoses poke above the deck plates, fat eels coursing with effluent. Smaller hoses loop like streamers between ship and shore, sucking a fresh supply of clean water into the hold tanks. As the crew busy themselves with valves and gauges, boys are stationed at each attachment point, keeping an eye on the connections for signs they might blow, a foul and hazardous occurrence. I help Nog lock off the taps as each tank is filled, dread sitting on my bones like canker. I hope he might yet say something reassuring, but he doesn't. After supper, Gally Ma keeps me back to help, moth unable to do her usual chores and my captain busy with family celebrations. She seems distracted, wiping her workbench more times than it needs, and when the other boys have been dismissed to quarters, she leads me by the hand to her blue-green globe hidden in a flower bin and her picture books tucked behind the larder. The families blame the weather, she whispers, but it was they who broke us. Their combined force, the right hand of retribution, came down and squeezed the grey zone dry of hope. After that, it seemed we all became the shadows of our former selves. Under the yoke, no will left other than to comply. But the memory of our unmaking holds the key to being made again. And so I say to you, use these well and don't let memory rot to nothing. Then she does a surprising thing, draws me close and kisses my head before sending me off to my master's well-appointed cabin. Perhaps it was events at the 13 sail, or the capture of the Kosciuszko 12, but the captain seems to want more of my company about the ship. Her helmsman, relieved of watch, I am allowed the privilege of nights with her on the bridge as she commands the laden vessel through black waters, navigating by pulsing shore beacons and direction markers set mid-canal. It gets bitterly cold, perched inside four screens of grimy glass. I shiver and am slung one of her fur wraps. Cuddling into that warmth and familiar scent, I feel a lulling peace that resonates with the years I had before thirteen. My baron is impervious to the chill. Her face the shape of concentration. She works the wheelhouse instruments with deft assurance, and gradually, mesmerised by the pattern of her movements, I begin to imagine her hands are my own. We stay like that, hour after hour, enveloped in the strange calm that night brings to the grey zone, and I think perhaps she feels it too. A companionate hiatus, brief respite from the disharmonious affairs of the iron families. Boots clang on hatchway ladders, figures hurry past the cabin door. All the decks locked down, the boys are being summoned one by one for questioning. Moth, going to Galley Ma for comfort in the night, had found her sprawled among her saucepans, dead. Nog says the confessions extracted from the Kosciuszko 12 all led back to her. She must have known they would, and did the deed quickly before they came for her. I feel as if the ship has tipped into a sickening lurch. Ma! Love's mooring lost, the past's last tether cut, and I cast adrift in a perpetual night. I squeeze tight against my chains in a corner of the cabin and thank Aditi that she's been spared the family's punishments. But I have never seen the captain so distraught. Her fist lands hard against the panelling above me and dents it. She doesn't seem to notice and lets fly again. The entire section splinters. Her hand drips blood. I am frightened, even though I know it's not aimed at me or mine, but the unthinkable. Her own family. I peek upwards. They will pay, she mutters. And then the realisation strikes me. 
Her passion, not one she has ever shown to me, is that for a true love. Gally Mar's secret place inside my captain's padlocked heart. Distracted, all mood gone for play, she undoes my manacles and leaves. I wait a count of one hundred, then slip outside along the passage into the galley. Its porthole deadlights are all latched. In the dark I stumble on a chaos of strewn pots, the place where the body had lain and is now removed. But I am not here for that, the empty shell of my beloved Ma. I am here to take possession of her globe and picture books before the barons find them. As I hurry Ma's things back to the cabin, the ship's bell sounds, Eyes port! And when her treasures are safely relocated, I climb reluctantly above deck. The crew and boys are all eyes fixed on the giant shapes rearing portside in the fog. I scan anxiously for the captain. Crake sidles up beside me. He points and sneers. What they brought back from Kosciuszko is hanging over there. The cranes have gone up, and there are our angels, Mars' intrepid relatives who'd escaped the slamming grip of the iron families to live in sunshine, hung in rows like coats on hooks, each neat brown pair of hands and feet limp below the sackcloth. No more our angels than the family's seditious enemy, now they are the dead, and decomposing with them hope. As we come alongside just beyond, Crake mocks again. Then, called out to a family berthing, he clambers off the ship past Nog and swiftly disappears, a venal, hated man, into the separating twilight. The captain gives the entire crew shore leave and goes to drown her sorrows on a girl barge. Nog, wanting to keep his infirmity well hid, volunteers to stay behind. The ship sits in mist, its cargo offloaded and abandoned on the wharf up current from the spider-legged crane still dangling their catch. The dark falls, a wet, clinging shroud. The canal wind cuts like garroting wire. And we are huddled on the foredeck, crying silently down on moth, frail and folded, crushed beneath the forecastle winch. Something, a wall, breaks suddenly in me, and I race below as if pursued by death itself to drag the heavy pelts and fat silk pillows back from my stash and spin the globe. Countries blur with sea. I stop the vivid blue-green swirl with a finger and peer close. A pair of smaller islands southeast of ours. Closer. Aotearoa home to the Iron family's long-time opponents, rumoured to have helped orchestrate the Kyoto uprising. As I measure the distance in finger widths, thinking of Nog's boat and the locks that lead to ocean, Aggie rests a shimmery hand on mine. You'll drown, she says, and be eaten by fish. Is that so bad? I interject. She traces my most recent scar. Unless you take the ship, the ship's boys are for it. Already without Galley Ma, her subtle protection not fully realised until now, the crew, egged on by Crake, have been inflicting punishments at every opportunity. The boys, suffering, feel Ma's absence as keenly as those icy winds that luge between the levee walls. But worse, far worse, Moth, our littlest and most recent to fall foul of the Baron's casual cruelty, was adored. I go to Nog. Knowing his time is as short as ours, I tell him what we plan to do, then ask, Would you rather be sent to the filthy bottom of a canal by Crake, or come with us and be joined forever with the sea? His face is a rumpled spread of seams and stubble. Pain has made bruises of his eyes. He winces as his bad leg briefly takes some weight. Resting gratefully against the bulkhead, he makes his decision for his heart's first love. With Nog on lookout for the crew's return, we assemble in the galley to make fast our plan. How will we manage the ship? 
been, the pluckiest, asks after I've shown them Aotearoa on the globe. Eight is enough, I answer. Between us we have all the skill we need. If we can slip unnoticed through an outer lock, we'll be away and won't be followed. They know the sea locks are generally unattended, being used infrequently and only for the long hauls north or south the families much preferring to hop between their territories in calmer and more manageable waters. Who'll steer? Bin asks for them all. I've spent some hours in the captain's company at the helm, I say, not mentioning that Aggie, whose inquiring mind had ever risked and learnt much more than me, will instruct. Last minute the boys waver between sure purgatory and uncertain fate, until I remind them of Gallimard's final admonition, and then they draw toward the plan as if to a distant saving light, while I wish I could feel even small measure of the confidence I pretend. And so we loose the mooring lines from their bollards and let the night ship drift, a sullen juggernaut down canal to an outer lock, as the boys launch one last defiance, sending Craig's belongings tumbling overboard. The ship pitches horribly. Most boys are sick. Its bearings set southeast and our sights toward the hope of land. I have had to lash the wheel to stop it spinning like a gyro through my grasp. But past the anchor winch and gatling gun, Aggie leans, a five-point star above the prow, hair flying, face pressed to the wind. Nog is dying. Laid in his dinghy, roped secure on the foredeck, he is being rocked like baby with the ship and smiling up at sky. From my navigator's storm-battered eerie, I look out beyond each terrifying lift and plunge to what he sees. Not the fog-bound night of moonless waters, but the wild, pale, breaking blue of day. This month's review book is The Last Albatross, book one of the Human Rights Trilogy by Ian Irvin. The Last Albatross is a book for the here and now because it's a near-future thriller that deals with the terrible threat of global environmental meltdown. The fact that the book was written and published nine years ago and has now been updated and reissued is slightly depressing because the scenario of global warming and government in action it paints is even more realistic today than it was in 2000. As well as being the international best-selling author of the Three Worlds fantasy series, Ian Irvin is a marine scientist and an expert in marine pollution. So he brings scientific rigour and expert knowledge to the environmental scenarios he projects in the book as well as an accomplished writer's hand in building a believable near-future world. What could on the face of it be a depressing story about a world in decline is actually a well-paced and action-filled thriller. All too believably, environmental groups spurred on by years of government dithering have gone feral. Governments themselves talk about the need for action, but instead protect national interests. And corrupt corporations keep information on rising sea-level projections to themselves, in order to make a killing on the property market. Against this backdrop, Gemma and Rin, an ordinary married couple beset with all the problems of life you might expect, are drawn into a deadly plot as they try to head off an old university friend bent on using half a kilo of plutonium to teach humanity a lesson about its rapacious ways. Weaving their way between nihilistic environmentalist cults, organised crime and dodgy policemen, they learn that despite the danger posed by their friend, there are darker and more organised forces at work, including single-minded and, let's face it, clinically insane environmental activist Ulf Bammert, whose homicide manifesto outlines a systematic plan to eradicate the human race from the planet by the fastest means possible. While one threat is averted, albeit not with a significant cost to those involved, it is the threat of the homicide manifesto that will be explored in the remaining two books of the Human Rights Trilogy, published later in 2009. 
The Last Albatross is an exciting, chilling, thought-provoking and not-so-speculative fiction novel. Three stars. The Last Albatross by Ian Irvin is published in Australia by Simon & Schuster. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured authors' websites and for details of their publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2009. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. <laughs>